Hey, my name's Jared Moon, and I'm part of a group of underground athletes you've probably never even heard of before. Most of us don't even have gym memberships. We don't have every piece of equipment known to man, nor do we have a ton of time to train. And we don't need it because we're achieving amazing things without it. We are Garage Gym Athletes, and these are our stories. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Garage Gym Athlete Podcast. Jared Moon here with Ashley Hicks. How's it going, Ashley? Going good. And we have Joe Courtney. What's up, Joe? Oh, bonjour, Jared. <laughs> bonjour, Jared. There you go. Is that, is that French? Yes. It's about the yeah. extent of it. I think Ashley's a huge or, fan sorry, of the French. We. We, we. We, we. All right, let's... Um, Let's talk more about that. No, here, I'm going to I'm gonna go into the announcements. Uh, so bringing back some sponsors, uh, I mentioned at the end of the last podcast because I randomly saw Joe's note as we were concluding that <laughs> intro um, about Broccoli. So, and I'm going to mention officially here, Broccoli is a sponsor of this podcast. It was a hefty seven-figure amount to get Broccoli to, uh, you know, do this one episode. So we're very thankful to broccoli and the, and the health it provides. So there, go eat your broccoli. And I think we've mentioned this before, but Joe, you don't like broccoli or no, I do. you do? No, you yeah, do. I pretty much, we, we pretty much eat all vegetables and broccoli is a pretty common one. You like it cooked raw, steamed. I don't do um, any vegetables raw. That's just flash like seared. Uh, I, I, that, I mix that's it ar- did you say that's archaic? That's archaic to eat vegetables uh, uh, raw. Yeah. I mean, we have the technology now. What about like a veggie this. tray? Like if something's like at a party, you don't just partake? It, 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 it looks nice. That's about it. D- dip it in a little ranch. All right, Ashley. Maybe. Ashley, what's your take on broccoli? Dude, we're actually, uh, f- so for the women's health track, we're on some low carb days. So I just uh, did my week of meal plans and the next day we have carbs, we are doing a stir fry and there's going to be lots of broccoli and rice noodles. So excited. That's awesome. I used to eat a ton of broccoli and now I'm not eating that much at all because huh. uh, I was doing all my meal prep, oh, but then right. I bought a ridiculous amount of that uh, Ice Age meals. And so... I just haven't done any, I, I don't know when I'm going to have to do meal prep again, uh, but he doesn't have any broccoli in it. He has other vegetables, but no no broccoli. So when I do my own meal, meal prep, there's lots of broccoli involved. So, so another thing I do, uh, just broccoli tangent, here we go. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's just hit the gas pedal yeah. on the broccoli tangent. Uh, well, when you buy broccoli, it comes with these giant stalks and the stems. Most people throw away the stems. So I save the stems and I dice them up like real fine. And I just throw them in my scrambles because stems have a lot of the nutrients and they even had, it even has protein. What the scramble you? dude, the scramble is crazy. I think we talk about the scramble at least once I know. every episode. His scramble <laughs> is like, <laughs> when, when are you going to give up the scramble, man? I don't know why I would. <laughs> whenever i can't cook that's when i give up the scramble it's been slowing okay. down some like some days i've just been doing some other random stuff but it's still there your scramble is my shake I'll exactly put it that way. Yeah. okay well let, let's me let me roll through the rest of these announcements and then we get to some updates because so i think we're already like pretty far in here uh so two quick announcements from me first we posted this in our uh, group, but also it's open to anybody who listens to this podcast. If you go to garagegymathlete.com slash AMA, you can submit questions, topics, ideas, all sorts of stuff. And this is twofold. If it's a, a broad enough topic or study, we could actually just cover that here, like h- how we normally do. Uh, but there'll also be a secondary segment coming in the next couple of weeks uh, where I will be doing uh, video slash podcast episode covering these maybe one at a time be shorter in nature but just getting uh, the answer to the question research backed all that kind of stuff and, and knocking that out so if you want to be a part of that garage forward slash ama and then the next thing killing comfort book uh, as some of you've heard me talk about it before but i'm getting close enough now to being done and entering the editing process with an editor and everything with with that to mention it uh, you can go to killingcomfort.com and you will be able to enter your name, email address, and what, how this kind of works kind of behind the scenes of launching a book. The book won't launch until next year, uh, but I'm trying to get you know, 50, maybe max 100 people uh, that I could send advanced copies that can you know, help 
help uh, push the information, all this stuff. And, and you get it all for free. Um, and then the kind of the, what I ask in return is if you read it and like it, when I send you an advanced copy, you, you leave a review, so on and so forth. Um, not a lot of work involved for you. It's really more if you're like, hey, I want to be the first 50, 100 people to get my hands uh, on a copy of this book. Go to killingcomfort.com and you will be in the running. It is very much going to be first come, first serve. Uh, I'll keep mentioning it, but, uh, you know, build up as many people as possible. But I'm really excited to get the book out. It's been, I've been working on it for a long time and uh, books are super uh, annoying. They're a lot of work and a lot of editing and, but I absolutely love it at the same time. Kill, killing that comfort in writing one. <laughs> All right. You guys have any questions about the book? You, you, I don't know. You probably think I just like, I'm actually talking about it. You guys haven't seen any of it. I no, think it's fake, don't you? We've still been, yeah. But I think it's just a journal. You just <laughs> talk about how uncomfortable you are. Captain's log. Yeah. Captain. Yeah. This work well, may be uncomfortable. It's a myth. Well, it'll, it'll be the best book I've ever written, having only written one before. So yeah. I can for sure say that. Worst you can do is second place. Yeah. And at, at worst, yeah, it'll be the second best book I've ever written. <laughs> okay. Joe, updates from you, man. Uh, not much going on. Um, the spin bike that I said last week that I got, um, the so far the best thing about it is the Space Saver. And that's because it hasn't arrived yet. So. <laughs> wow. So, yeah, that, that lightning deal really swamped that company. Yeah. It was like, hey, if you lightning deal, you can get it in like two days. And then two days later, like, oh, sorry, it's delayed five days. And then yesterday's like, cool, it's arriving by eight. And then like 8.30, I get an update. It'll be here in the next two or three days. Oh, sweet. Man, Some, that's brutal. So many people got the bike. So good thing I haven't exactly been counting on it or needed it, but I'm, I'm, I'm wanting it. Dude, I've been bait and switched like that on some shipping for, and I just, I shut it down. <laughs> refund, refund my money. I wanted that yesterday. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But I, I, that's definitely happened to me more than a few times. Um, Anytime FedEx is delivering something to my house, I mean, I don't want to talk crap about FedEx, but maybe it's just Argyle, Texas and FedEx don't get along. They're never right. Like it's, it's coming today. It's on the truck. Yeah. Like, Great. That's awesome. And then they're like, oh, no, 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 no. Just kidding. It'll be uh, two days. I think oh, kind of similar. Yeah. Oh, is it FedEx? Yeah. You're screwed. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Ashley, how about uh, updates from you? Uh, yeah. So I actually just got back from Wales a few hours ago. So we, uh, that was our last trip on the Island, if you will. So we've got, uh, basically a little bit less than like two and a half weeks. And then we are back stateside, which is crazy to think about. Um, so what are you going to do? Like you travel so much right now. What are you going to do when you get back in, in the States? Are you just, are you going to like, so basically we bought a house and we're renovating. So, um, we actually close on the house tomorrow, uh, which that has been some fun shenanigans, but that always is that way. Right. With house buying and plus we're buying a house when you're in a different country state I've done before country seems like there might be an even n another layer of difficulty. Oh, there. Yeah. So, um, basically we're going to make sure that that, you know, goes smoothly. We got this awesome contractor that, uh, we have a really cool guy that, uh, is also a strike Eagle pilot that has used this guy before. So he's going to actually start the renovations basically the last week that we're here. And so by the time we get there, the goal is to be in the TLF, which for civilians means just temporary living facility that the military puts you up in until you have a house. Um, so the goal is to be there as little as we possibly can. And we shipped our stuff last week. So that way our stuff can get there. Hopefully, uh, by the time <laughs> our house is done with renovation, but you never know with these deals as Jared and Joe can echo <laughs> because they've dealt with it too. It's a good time. So. Yeah. We're, yeah. we're going to start ours like at least 90 days before we actually want them to, to be there. <laughs> Because of being overseas. Yeah. Are they going to give you guys temporary furniture? Like our house, we have temporary furniture. So there's basically nothing in our house but a temporary bed, two dresser drawers, and we have this couch. And it's all from like the 1980s. So our house <laughs> looks real goofy right now. Oh, your house right now, they're doing that because they had to ship your yeah. stuff. Got yeah, it. Yeah. yeah. No, I, um, I mean, I think I, I've had a fairly... While in the military, the process is fairly simple. Moving not military is way worse <laughs> and costs a lot more. 
Yeah. Um, so I'm trying to limit doing that as much as I can in the, in the future, but yeah, it is a, it's a pain moving in general sucks, but that's why Emily and I own basically nothing. Um, we really don't, we don't own a lot of stuff just because it makes moving so much easier. If, and when we want to move, we don't have any plans right now, but you never know that could change next week. So we're, we're crazy like that. Joe always gives me a hard time about that. (laughs) Yeah. He's like, yeah, until you change your mind, 48 hours. Yeah, garage. All right. You can see the more awesome garages out there. Yeah, I get, was it, envious of other garages, and I have to go <laughs> go implement a new plan. But uh, only update I have for me is kind of funny, and it was spurred from the last update I gave on the last episode, the Rob Wolf intro. I talked about not being able to PR. I don't know if I'm going to PR my Murph. And then I PR it like over a minute minute and some change, minute 20, minute 30, something like that, uh, PR'd Murph. And part of the reason was the conversation I had with Joe in the intro on that, that last episode, I was like, man, you sound like a little baby, <laughs> you know, listening. I listened to, I was like, what are you talking about? You know, like you, it hurts. Like you don't want to go faster. Like, and so I just changed my mind and decided to go faster. And that's the advice I always give, right? <laughs> just go and so I took my own advice. Finally, I went a little bit faster on the first mile. I went unbelievably fast on the calisthenics. And then I just tried to not have the wheels fall off on the last mile. It wasn't super fast, but like, it was just like, what can I do here? But I knew starting the mile that I was going to PR because I had that much time. I was like, I, it wasn't that pressing, you know, just for PR. I was like, this is absolutely going to happen. Cause I think I started the last mile with almost nine minutes left before it would hit my PR time. And the last time I ran a nine minute mile was in the first grade. So like, yeah, that's, that's where I'm at. Hit the PR. Uh, so my advice take away from everybody else, just go faster and push yourself harder because sometimes it just works out. So just curious, did you do like round, like a triple round or whatnot? Or did you, how did you up your calisthenics? Nope. Five, 10, 15, uh, just crush it. Uh, did not stop. Uh, yeah, so I did 20 rounds of 5, 10, 15. That's always been my fastest. I really thought for a long time that like doubling up and doing 10 rounds was going to be the faster way to do it. But 5, 10, 15 is just so fast and there's basically no muscle fatigue involved. And so that's that's how I do it. And I use my, you guys have both uh, seen my garage gym. So I use my, my yoke, the fat pull-up bar, uh, because it's not super tall. So I, I have, I can reach up just enough. Like I don't have to jump or anything. I just kind of stretch up and, and latch onto it. And so if, if I had to like jump up to my bar, which is at like 14 yeah. feet or whatever it is in my, my ceiling, that would probably slow me down. So it's just a matter of five drop 10 and then 15 and the squats are the thing. And, and I've mentioned this in articles and past podcasts, squats is where everyone slows down, even if you don't know it. And so it takes a lot of mental focus. Like the first 10 rounds is pretty easy to just like stay locked in, focus, go fast. The last 10 is where you can continuously be moving, but you're losing time because you're moving more slowly than you should. And so that's why I like um, using the Apple Watch for Murph because I can just double tap each round and that's what I would do. So I double T double tap around and it would say, okay, you finished that one 36 seconds, 34 seconds. And then once I noticed one was getting up to like 43 seconds, I was like, and that was right at 10 or 11. I was like, not going to happen. You need to get that back down. So I had to speed back up, which is all in the squats, just uh, making sure that you're, you're not like resting at the top. You're just continuous movement as fast as you can on the squats. So that's the, uh, the long winded answer there. The official time was 26, 27. You're my hero. And I like it. I wish it was 26, 26, <laughs> but 26, 27 works. Oh, no. All right. But the time was what it is. Well, let's get into the study. Pretty interesting one. So we have cooling during exercise enhances performances, but the cooled areas matter. A systematic review with meta analyses. All right. I feel like the whole study is just ruined right off the bat because everyone knows um, what we're going to talk about and the results of it. Um, so I'm going to go over just some some notes I took. Basically, a meta-analysis, as we've mentioned multiple times, or I have, 
this it, it's a it's a culmination of a lot of studies, and I really like these just because of how much data you're getting. Um, you know, it's like uh, when you're when someone writes a book, um, like say on business or health, whatever. The reason I like people re- writing people's books, or uh, reading people's books, is because they have spent years, maybe a decade, ten years, or whatever, on that topic, and they've consolidated everything they know in that one book. And now you get to like shortcut their learning journey. Um, and, and get all that knowledge. It's like going into the matrix to me. It's the same with these meta analysis because there are 45 different studies. It took years to complete. If you put across all the time on these different studies, how many different people did it, all that stuff. And now we're like, okay, we we are going to just look at what are the overall results of cooling across 45 different studies. And to break it down even further, further, 36 of the studies looked at aerobic specific and nine anaerobic and not specifically strength training. So that's important to note in the in the overall breakdown of the study, let me see if there's any other things I want to hit on before we kind of dive into some of the results. Um, as far as the makeup of the studies, there's, uh, yeah. Do you? Well, wanna- I just have another. They did a, a really good range in like when they. I know they. I think it was the aerobic one. They had anywhere from five minutes to ninety minutes or something like that. So, so they, yeah. they had a pretty good range of of uh, the selected ones. Yeah, I think that the. Um, the different studies they they picked were were awesome. We didn't we didn't pull up any of those individual ones. That's the only thing I wish that we did, so we could like Joe mentioned the range, which is awesome. But I do wish that we could have dove into a little bit more of specific, like you know, because they do a lot of cycling stuff, running stuff, and, and broken it down even further. Uh, but we just didn't. There are just too many studies. Um, overall, what we have are overall conclusions of you know what's good and what's bad. So. The a couple other things just to note, um, there are two different methods, uh, external cooling, which is like wearing a vest or some sort of garment or spraying water on yourself. And then there's inter- internal cooling, which is drinking ice water, specifically mentioned in, in one of the studies, uh, negative one to four degrees Celsius. So zero degrees is, is 32 degrees Fahrenheit, right? So um, just to give you frame of reference, there is about like close to freezing. Or, I mean, I don't know how you drink below freezing water, but that, you know, mix it up real fast or something like that. Um, and so that's how cold it has to be. And and that's just a good thing to know because, okay, maybe maybe it can be a little bit warmer than, than freezing, obviously, but it has to be pretty freaking cold water. And they said 6.5 ounces at a time. Um, they ha- they gave one uh, race that uh, it was a 20 kilometer bike race, I believe, and they were drinking it uh, every five kilometers. So 6.5 ounces, I think that's like a more doable thing too, if you guys want to, to try any of this stuff out. And then I think that was it. Oh, there's per cooling and pre cooling. So results were about the same, close to the same on cooling before. Uh, and cooling during, but I, I mean, I think that you should just do both if you're really going to try this as a, as a performance enhancer, because like, just don't, don't try and do a double blind, like placebo controlled experiment, like just do everything you can to increase your performance. So do it pre, do it during and uh, after doesn't matter as much because you're not performing anymore. Um, so that's, that's basically all, um, the need to know is, do you guys have anything you want to mention before I kind of reveal the results? Or, you know, this mainly table two is what I'm going to go over. And then that'll be it. I didn't know like, about it. Oh. After. Nope. Sorry, Joe. No, right. I just I can touch on my stuff after. All right, cool. Actually, I didn't you have even anything? know there was such a thing as a cooling vest. Like I've, I've looked it up after they were talking about it and that it's only $30. You know, you think of something that would cool your entire body would be a little more expensive. And then why is it only a vest? Because it was talking about full body cooling so why you know what i mean like is mm-hmm. there not a garment that is like head to toe kind of thing i mean there probably is but if you think about how hard that would have to be right? to like wear and like but i want to i actually want to once i i didn't really know about these vests either and i i really want to dive into it more because i would love to do murph with a 20 pound <laughs> ice vest that's yeah. like that's perfect right because even if even if the ice melts if they're ice packs like all the ice packs i have in my freezer the water doesn't go anywhere so ice and water are going to weigh the same 
um, even if it melts. So it's not like, oh, it's getting lighter as you go on. Like that's not what would happen. You would just eventually maybe, I don't know, it, it probably, to be honest, wouldn't even melt in, in 25 to 30 minutes. So probably still be ice at the end of, end of the, the Murph workout. So I'm very, honestly, very interested in trying that out. That might be something I do just like as an yeah. experiment, uh, throw on, but I just, I don't know. I'm pretty picky with how a vest fits during Murph. So like I'm, I'm feeling that these $30 vests with ice packs, not going to be like super comfortable. If I, maybe there's a way I can like throw them into my, my condor century or something. But yeah, I really, I really want to try that. Um, all right, let me go to the quick findings. So aerobic exercise, like I said, that was the majority of the studies, 36 of them. They said per cooling, so this is during improved performance versus not cooling. Uh, per cooling is effective when the ambient temperature is both high and normal. So if it's hot outside, yeah, cool yourself down. If it's normal, cool yourself down and uh, it's going to work. Cooling the head and neck with a collar, wearing an ice vest, and fluid ingestion appear to be the best methods of per cooling. And decreasing skin temperature by about two degrees Celsius is preferable. Now, next on anaerobic exercise uh, finding summary, uh, the benefit is not as large for aerobic exercise, but there's still a small effect versus no cooling. Uh, anaerobic exercise only benefits only benefits from per cooling when the ambient temperature is already high. So anaerobic, to me, um, they said it wasn't specifically strength training, but anaerobic can be strength training. It can be very short burst conditioning, you know, if we're talking about energy systems. So um, intervals, like things like that, just to kind of put these in, things in perspective for uh, a garage gym athlete. And the overall case here is it's not that great for, it's not as good as aerobic. And this makes a lot of sense to me and I'll, I'll kind of hit on why I think so. Um, but yeah, if it really only helps if it's, if it's hot outside, um, only whole body cooling was effective at increasing performance and decreasing skin temperature about 2.5 degrees Celsius is preferable. Um, so like I mentioned, you know, on the different, like, okay, it, it's not as great for anaerobic, but way better for aerobic. That makes a lot of sense because aerobic, your body is just like heating up over a longer period of time. Um, and I mean, just from an aerobic standpoint, energy system, how long that is, Joe, you mentioned the range five to 90 minutes, your, your body, your temperature is just going to keep increasing, you know, until it gets to a certain point and probably stay there. Uh, and that's why you, you start sweating cause your body's trying to cool you down and, and all this stuff. And, uh, that makes a lot of sense. But when you're doing, if you think about like a 10 second burst, a sprint and a pretty normal temperature, like you may not even break a sweat. If it was 65 degrees outside and I told you to do a 10 second sprint, you may not sweat at all. And so it makes sense to me that cooling your body down doesn't, doesn't help that much. Cause I don't really think that there's any performance degradation from getting too hot in sprints, unless it was, you know, and this makes a lot of sense. And it, it's true from the study. If I was doing a uh, hundred meter or 200 meter sprints, but it was 107 degrees on the track, which is not abnormal. Yeah. That's going to affect my performance. So cooling myself off makes, makes a lot of sense. And then it just makes total sense to me to like, yeah, if I'm running seven miles, cooling my body off during that time period is going to increase my performance. And, and I've seen this a hundred times with Murph. I, you know, I've talked about it that, this this PR I just got, it was 64 degrees outside because uh, there was this random cold front that came through. And that's the only reason P I PR, I guarantee it. Now, when it's, uh, you know, 70% humidity and 100 degrees in my garage and I my time is four minutes slower than that, that makes sense to me because, you know, my my heart is working harder. My body's trying to cool itself down. So a lot of this does make sense. And then we can we can talk about like how to do this a little bit more, but now I want to hear more from, from you guys. On so anything I think you have. I'll start just with you, to, for what you were just saying, I think the anaerobic parts were a bit limited and um, yeah, the, the, they were almost too short of durations. And I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm wrong but isn't different between aerobic and anaerobic, just heart rate zones. Like, can't you just do anaerobic, but for a longer time? Uh, I mean, technically it goes down to, if we're talking about energy systems, so anaerobic is just without oxygen. So anytime, like it, it's got to be short bursts to where your body doesn't have to start using oxygen for energy. So that would be these five, 10, 15 second bouts. That's why lifting normally is categorized in anaerobic, but you can also do like short sprints. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily equate to, it can, it doesn't necessarily equate to, um, 
Okay. Heart, heart I guess that's why it's yeah. is somewhat limited, at least at least to me, because yeah, you, your body just doesn't have enough time to uh, to heat up. Um, the the ingesting one was uh, kind of funny. So a, cu- a couple of points of here is that they they kind of hit on other things that we've talked on before. So with the ingesting cool, um, we talked about hydration in the past about how like some of the ultra ultra runners and people they don't really drink very much because when they drink, it kind of alters their body's temperature, which actually decreases their performance. So I was kind of hit or miss. I was wondering how that would, how, how that actually played out. And, um, I, but, but it's, it's good. They had like the small six or so ounce and, um, a measurement versus just like a drinking a bunch. So it's not cause, cause that could also, people could get carried away. Of, oh, this is cold. I'm going to drink a whole bunch of it to cool off, but then your, your stomach's going to get full and you're just not going to feel good. Yeah, I was actually really glad that that was mentioned because that was the first thing I thought of when I was reading the internal stuff before I got to like, well, how much? Because if I were to drink 32 ounces of ice cold water in the middle of a workout, I, you know, maybe it cools me off and helps, but having a quarter gallon in my stomach just sloshing around trying to cool me off uh, would affect my performance. So the fact, I mean, 6.5 ounces every say like 20 minutes, that's pretty easy to do and not, not too much water to affect you. So Um, I think that's cool. And then another part for when we went over uh, a while back about recovery and ice baths and how they can be good for recovery, but not necessarily because you you still need the blood flow. So if you're adding ice to your body while you're working out, does that pushing out the blood flow, which means it, you could be hurting yourself or not, maybe not, not necessarily hurting yourself, but it might be, a temporary increase in performance. But my thought was what about overall in in progress? Like if you're slapping ice on yourself in the middle of every workout, how is it going to affect you in the long run versus the short run? Yeah. I mean, but there's also the, the counterpoint to that, that, um, like prolonged intense aerobic exercise, maybe, maybe that's what's bad for you, but cooling down, keeps you normal um but yeah we don't have studies to, to point either direction there so but it was, it, either it was definitely really good to see with the uh, the cooling down um i was one of my first thought was like if it's actually cool out or whatever if you can actually have cool water just douse yourself in in the hose maybe that's maybe that's your full bottle body cooling like twice a week yeah and i mean i've done this uh specifically in murph workouts with ice cold water not as a performance strategy i didn't read any studies um I just had like some ice water. Uh, I think, I think I was like, I just got back from a mile run. Emily was in the garage and I'm about to hop on the pull-up bar. And I was like, can you bring me some water? And, uh, you know, just mention that as I'm walking to the, to the bar and she brings me a cup full of ice water, um, which is, was fine. I'm like, okay, whatever. I drank a, like a sip of it. Uh, this wasn't this last PR, Murph. There's no no time for that yeah. shenanigans if you're trying to PR. Uh, but I, I drank like a sip. But before I started my second mile, uh, I basically just poured this ice cold water right on the back of my skull, like, you know, right at the base where your spine kind of hits and immediately felt like a hundred times better because it was just it's so hot and like um, so difficult to move during move fast if you're if you're overheating and that helps significantly so i you know anecdotally i've i've definitely experienced some of that just throwing water on you and and cooling off in the process yeah ashley how about you um, what are i your echo thoughts? exactly what you just said in soccer i gosh when you have off-season training in dallas heat you know you're play you're training in the middle of the day at like what is it in the summertime, Jared, you know, you did, um, high school sports, like 110 degrees outside and you just, you know, the, uh, trainers have the ice water out. So we used to do that all the time, just douse ourselves in water. So that way we, (laughs) we could keep going. But, um, I think the thing that stuck out to me and I wrote it down, I just was, they didn't mention ingesting anything for anaerobic stuff. They only talked about it for aerobic, um, they didn't really give a reason why for that, but, um, yeah, I just found that interesting. And then the other thing I thought of too was, you know, if you were just what you talked about, Joe, you said spraying yourself down. I was like, well, I guess if you've got like a, if you do like ice baths, you could just hop in your little ice bath real quick and just jump out. But you, I guess you'd be soak, soaked doing it. So it's probably not the safest thing to doing when you're lifting, <laughs> but 
Yeah, I mean, they mentioned, I mean, there's cooling like I just mentioned. So like pouring ice water on your head. Uh, you could do, they mentioned vests that you that you mentioned as well. Then there's like apparently collars. And if you've ever seen those things, like they sell them at a lot of like Home Depot, Lowe's type stores. Uh, those, they like hold on to water. They're like these little, um, these like small towels, right? That I don't know if you guys have seen them or know what I'm talking about, but they absorb water. And then they, they stay cool for really long periods of time. But you can like freeze those. Like we've used those with our kids uh, in sports when it's really hot. Uh, you can kind of wrap around your neck and, and that that helps out a lot as well. There's a lot of easy ways to, to get this stuff done. There's hand cooling, which we've talked about that one before. Um, just cooling off your hands and like a bucket of ice or something seems to increase performance. Uh, but a lot of this, uh, you know, I think it's worth trying. I, I want to, I will probably right after this order a, an ice vest. I will, I'll look at them and see if I want one. And, and I might try my next Murph or Murph in a few weeks. Uh, if I can get 20 pounds of ice to fill that thing, I don't know. It's gonna be hard. You might have to, you might have to, that's that one gallon is eight pounds. Um, so I'd have to have two and a half gallons on me somehow. Um, if my math serves me correct. Yeah. I mean, maybe I could just like, (laughs) um, light, lighten my, lighten my vest and throw in like, maybe some, some ice things that I already have. So I could try that as well. I'll, I'll look into it. I want to, I want to see, I mean, at this point for it to be scientific for me, well, I'd have to break a PR I just set. So, or I, or just be like, no, I felt better, uh, you know, but to see actual performance increases, that's what I'd have to do. Right. Is like, um, I don't know. So that, that one's hard. Maybe I'll try it. Maybe I won't. That's, I forgot how much water that would be. That's a lot of two and a half gallon. Just imagine two milk jugs, gallon milk jugs hanging off of you while you're, you do or two and a half of them really. Um, yeah, so that's, that's that. I mean, it seems like it's, it's definitely worth trying and, you know, just from a practical standpoint, try the 6.5 ounces of, um, ice cold water if you can. Um, and then maybe, maybe a vest or I think cooling your hands is probably the next easiest thing. And like I said, this just makes perfect sense to me on the cooling yourself during aerobic exercise. Maybe this should just echo that that's important. Body temperature is important. If you're trying to increase your performance, making sure you're cooled off somehow. Um, but it also makes perfect sense to me if we're just talking about anaerobic, I know this wasn't specifically about strength training, but that is kind of where strength training lies. As far as energy system is concerned, energy systems are concerned it wouldn't make any sense to me to get really cold and that and somehow increase your, your strength performance or even like this short burst stuff. Uh, but I see getting hotter. Like if any, if you've gotten, gotten hot, you realize like you can't run as fast. Like you, you guys agree with that. Like you, you're just feel like awful. Like Joe, I know you've, you've trained in some pretty hot temperatures. Like you just don't feel yourself. Yeah. You don't feel like um, you're capable. I wish of I had some of these uh, when I was playing lacrosse in the summer, because that's terrible. Cause it's lacrosse in the summer and then pads on top of that. <clears throat> yeah so i mean it, it just and then yeah yeah it makes sense it makes sense to me cool yourself off if you want to increase your performance and m- where could this like really fit into our training i don't know i think some sort of uh cooling yourself right before like a 2000 meter row 1.5 mile run things that we test maybe a mile run um just trying it in in those instances especially yeah, if it's hot we outside. did the, the uh, study about a, uh, resting and recovery and stuff uh, i've tried the the hand cooling one and i kind of liked it i can't remember if i was watching my heart rate at the time but um i think it went down when i was hand cooling my hands <laughs> interesting yeah and that one's that, those are just really easy that people could knock out and uh maybe increase their performance um, any more on the study before I move on to the topic? There's also no way to placebo those uh, those All right, cool. things. So, so it's not like they could do double blind studies or whatever. You know when you're getting cold. <laughs> Unless they just completely lie about what the study is about. Yeah, and that's and that's the thing with placebo, man, is like I love placebo because if if it works, it works. Like if you, if you give me a sugar pill and I run a mile a minute faster, I don't care if it's a sugar pill. I ran the mile faster and that's kind of how I feel about this. But you're, you're right. is like be really hard to do. And it could, there's always that like, well, what if it's just psychological? Eh, you're still getting faster. Right. So like, does it matter? Um, but yeah, that's uh, something that would be near impossible to control for here. Okay. So now we're going to get into an opinion topic. 
on phone usage. And I just want to hear what you guys think. And the reason I'm bringing this up, if you're wondering, like, what the hell, why are we, why did you have this idea? Um, I read an article the other day that um, people, say early 2000s or mid 2000s or whatever, on average, were using their phones about 60 to 90 minutes per day. Um, and then a new study came out, I think this was last year, saying that people on average are using it like 3.5 to 4 hours per day. Um, that's the average. I mean, some people are using their phones 6, 8, 9 hours a day. Um, and then, of course, yeah, there are going to be p- people with flip phones who use their phone like 5 minutes a day. Um, so I just think that it's really interesting. And the reason I think it's interesting, I won't get into like, you know, phones and all this other stuff, but if you like if you have an iPhone specifically, you can go to your screen time. <laughs> you can go to settings and screen time and look at how much you use your phone and that's reported. Uh, and so you know how much you're using it. And I just think anybody I like to crush people's excuses. That's why I did DIY projects back in the day. You know, I just I don't like for people to have excuses uh, for anything. If if you tell me that you're you can't meal prep, you tell me that you can't exercise, you don't have time for whatever. Um, and time is always a factor. It's something I've seen over and over and over and over again. Um, and so that's why I kind of want to bring this up because if you say you don't have time, <laughs> um, and I, I know what Joe's counterpoint is going to be, but if you say you don't have time, pull up your screen time and see if you, how much time you have. I don't know if this works on Android as well. Yeah. Um, you, uh, you both have an iPhone, right? Yeah. Okay. So y- you guys don't know either if it, if it's on Android, but on Apple, on uh, iPhone, you can, you can look at your screen time, see how much. And I, I'm not trying to say that you you have a problem. Hey, if you want to use your if you want to use your phone six hours a day, but you're still training, meal prepping, uh, being an awesome you know wife, husband, whatever, like father, then then great. Like then I, I don't care. I really don't care how much anyone uses your phone. But if you have any excuses on why you're not doing something or you wish you could do something, then this might be an easy place to leverage I some time. So what are you guys' totally thoughts agree overall? With you. Um, have you read the book Din- uh, Digital Minimalism? I have not yet. I mean, I yeah, love I um, Cal that. Newport. So, yeah, yeah, he's, so Scott, uh, he's written some great um, books, but I have not I read have that not one yet. I have not personally read the book. <laughs> My husband has, so Scott loves to read all sorts of stuff like this. But we, I want to say it was about a year ago, and Scott would just kind of brought it up. So we pulled up our phones and of course I was on my phone more than him and I'm super competitive as we've talked about a ton on this podcast. So I was like, I am going to beat Scott uh, on my weekly screen time goal. And so I basically just shut off all my notifications and it gave me exactly what you're saying. So much more free time. Um, And then for me, I found... Um, if you're a mama out there, shout out to you and your nursing, what you get bored, right? You don't just want to sit there and stare at your kid for gosh, you know, when they're small, they nurse for gosh, 30, 45 minutes sometimes. And so, you know, you just get out your phone, read something. I would read articles or get on Instagram, scroll endlessly. So I made it a goal like, okay, I'm going to cut that screen time out. And then, um, for me, like, you know, meal planning, doing certain things, like I like to add that into my schedule. So I just ended up uh, picking up piano lessons actually this, uh, this past month. So um, it, when I felt the need to get on the internet, either on my phone, my tablet, you name it, any kind of sort of device, I didn't do it and decided to go and get on the piano and play some scales and get back to doing something else. Now, am I ever going to use that? Maybe I might play in a band later. Who knows? I might be a rock star, but <laughs> I just think it's kind of cool that you can free up this time for just other things that you never thought you would do. So I totally agree with you. Never would have expected piano. Didn't see that coming. at all. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. I think it's a, a blend in between of kind of what you're both, you're both saying. I don't think you can like, Oh, I, I said this uh, earlier on before the podcast, but like, if even if you use your phone for six hours a day, you can't just like take those six hours and be like, Oh, you should just go train for an hour and a half instead or something because it's 10, 15 minutes at a time. You're on your phone. Not that's like saying, Oh, you, you know, it takes you five minutes to walk to the bathroom six times a day. Just go to the bathroom once and you'll have all that 30 minutes back. You can't really do that. Uh, I think that's, that's, you're probably right. If the phone usage time is like, if I had to like sit down and do the math on all this, 
I think that you're hundred percent right. If your phone usage is probably around two hours or less, um, especially an hour that that's true. But if you're, if you're honestly at the four to six hour range, like you could, you could, there, there is no 15 minutes at a time at that minute. Like that means there are time periods where you're sitting on your phone for 60 to 90 minutes straight. Like that's the only way you'd be able to fit it in. Um, so I, I do agree until you get to the, the later, like, cause I, I, you know, same with, with Ashley, like I was, uh, trying to be competitive with Emily and I wanted to get, make sure that my phone time was always less than an hour every single day on my screen time. And I feel like I wasn't using my phone at all. And it would still be like 56 minutes, but it would be like, you know, just like what you're saying, Joe, like little, like I pick it up to like, uh, you know, check a, a chat notification that we have, or like, you know, whatever, like all these like small little things and they do add up pretty fast. So as someone I feel like who doesn't use my phone a ton, um, you know, comparatively, like, I think, I think that's a hundred percent true, but that if you're on the greater, the, the higher end of that spectrum, um, there's gotta be some serious, like, yeah, I think, uh, kind of what Ash was saying, even know you're um, in. Or, or was, has been doing instead of just like scrolling through social media or watching random YouTube videos, like you can t- turn that into productive time. And I think, a while back, I th- um, uh, that's kind of like my read time, I guess. If you, if you just want to read something, um, it's good for that. Uh, just a l- little time here and there. Because that, that you can just throw in five, ten minutes. Um, but True. Yeah. But does it track your audible time? Because I'm not an audible person and you I two are. It's screen on. Because on audible, you can lock it. Okay. Yeah, because I, I listen to podcasts yeah, all the time through my phone. On. But it's locked. And yeah, it's like I- just playing through the speaker. Huh, good to know. Yeah. So if you're not actually phone on, at least with Apple, it, it won't count that because yeah, I, I listen to a lot of audio books, uh, some in the morning and some at night and, but my screen's never on during that time period. It's just normally headphones. So yeah, it, it won't count. Like it's not phone usage. My, it's specific and like, screen day. time. Um, not as much as I think, mm-hmm. especially because it's football season. I'm on it's not too way bad. more now. Not too bad. <laughs> you're on like your ESPN app. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's good. Um, well, and now I'll share like the more alarming um, study that that was done. I think it was last year. And I, sorry, I don't have the actual um, name of the study. I can I can give that uh, for the show notes. But uh, there's a study done last year uh, for teenagers, and specifically, and, and why I'm thinking about this stuff more and more because my kids are getting older. Teenagers who spend uh, the, I think it was four hours or above, uh, time period on their phone each day. Um, the more there's a correlation between the more hours spent on time with more, uh, factors that they qualify for, for being suicidal. Uh, so for ev- like at four, like there, there were sef- 17 different factors that they study that, uh, are, you know, common amongst people who create, who commit suicide and okay. Like at three hours, you probably have one of the 17 at four, you have like four of the 17, uh, at five hours, you six of the 17 at nine hours, you have like a phone usage a day, which is off the charts. You're like 17 out of 17, um, for having all the traits of someone who would commit suicide. This is 100% a correlation, correlative data. Um, the person who did the study is very adamant that phone usage in general is the problem, but I don't think that those conclusions can be drawn. I think that this is an interesting food for thought. I'll let the listener draw their own conclusions. I'm not doing any of that right now. I'm just pointing out some interesting data that's been brought up uh, just to kind of like leave this topic, like maybe think about it, yeah, but you don't have YouTube to. YouTube kids watch um, is so it's, ridiculous it's just from what I've pretty seen. Pretty crazy of stuff. Kid, just being around kids. Kids or, sorry. Yeah, I mean, and I don't even fully understand it, right? Like the, we, and I say we, cause we're all around the same age. None of us grew up with an iPhone in our face. So we don't really know what that's like. Uh, so I don't know what it's like to grow up that way. I mean, I got my first iPhone. I was in the air force. I was, I was married, you know, like it's been, um, I was already like through college, every, you know, everything before I got an iPhone. Um, so that using one of these to me is kind of just like a whatever, you know, not that big of a deal, but if you grow up with it, like that's, that's gotta be, it's gotta be hitting you at a different level that I don't even comprehend. And I'm not going to pretend like I do. So it's it's crazy stuff. All right. You guys are ready to work out or at least talk about one. 
<laughs> All right, Ashley, I'll let you uh, burr. I'll let you brief the, uh, right, the, the Meet Yourself Save Saturday me. workout. And basically, it's a 2,000 meter row or run. And then you're going to rest for seven minutes. And then you've got nine minutes of max burpees. And in that nine minutes, if you hit 109 burpees, you are saved. But if you do not, let's say you hit 108, which would be pretty brutal, and I would probably cry if I was you, then you have to do another 2,000 meter row or run for a time trial. So yeah, that is burpee save me. Moi, I have. Who's done it? (laughs) I've done it. Ashley's done it. Joe, have you done it? (laughs) Okay. What? I heard burpees in the title. This is an old one too, man. You should know. Totally That's true. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> so the the first time I ever did this, so I programmed it. Um, I had not done it, had not tested it yet. Uh, but I just, I had done, I do a lot of burpees or had done, I was doing a lot of burpees at that time. I just kind of knew like where the numbers should be and everything. But then I programmed it, put it in our programming uh, for Meet Yourself Saturday. And then I left on vacation to Colorado. This is the very first time I ever did it. And I was, um, (laughs) I was at like 10,000 feet elevation or something like that. Uh, but what is, isn't there like, um, yeah, so it doesn't really matter, but like there's, I don't think that I put any time limits in it, but you do the, you do the time trial. You could sandbag this 100%, right? Like, I don't think I, to my recollection, I didn't put any rules in place to where it needs to be a certain pace or anything. But it is a time trial, two thousand meter row. It doesn't just say row two thousand meters. It's a time trial. See how fast you can do it. So that sucks, <laughs> right? Like we've I've talked about how scared I am of two thousand meter rows. Rest seven minutes, nine minute max burpees. But I'm now at elevation. The first time I'm ever doing this workout, and I'm like, uh oh, like I might end up doing two two time trials. I'm gonna go ahead and put this oh. workout in the top seven worst workouts I've ever done. Um, because I was at elevation and so I did a, I did a very fast 2000 meter row. Um, I mean, I think it was around the seven minute mark, uh, pr- you know, plus or minus 10 seconds. And then I rested seven minutes and then I did the nine minutes max burpees. I, I swear I hit like 109 reps, like right at like eight fifty eight or something like that. Uh, it was like, I barely, barely made it. And I was like, could not breathe at all. So I didn't have to do, I've never, the burpees have always saved me, but it's, it was close the, the first time I did it. And since then it's been um, a little bit more manageable, but uh, um, Ashley, yeah, what are it's your pretty brutal. thoughts having we, completed? I also, the burpees have saved me. So I have not had to do the second time trial. I say that, but um, me and when my girls were here and we used to, we did this on base and uh, one of the girls was shy by like, I want to say it was five reps. So me and my other friend, we were totally being a bro. We're like, okay, we'll run your second 2000 meters with you because we didn't have rowers on base at the time. So we decided to run it. And so we did run the second one. So after I hit the 109 burpees, we did actually do the 2000 meter row run, but it's a, it's a good one. It's a fun one. I get, you know, my thing is always, I like to have a, a beat or something to get down with and, um, I, I don't like to rest a lot with burpees. That's my thing. Like if set a good pace, but if you just sit there and stare at the ground for like five to 10 seconds, by the time you're getting to the like six, seven minute mark, you're slowing down pretty significantly. So you just got to keep moving and you just got to tell your brain to shut up because you, you know, you may be dying, but you got to keep moving in order to be saved by the burpees is my little tips for this one. Yeah. Burpees are like squats, like air squats. I was mentioning in Murph people like they rest way too much. Like they're averaging like 10 seconds of burpee. If you really like sat there and like use a stopwatch, it's like get up. Like, okay. Whew, all right. Get back down. Uh, you know, it's just like this really slow process. And I think that moving fast on a burpee, um, <laughs> it makes them easier, not harder. So go faster will be my official advice on the, on the burpees. Just go a little bit faster than you normally would there. I'd say- be efficient. Um, Joe, with the you haven't done it, man, but you, you, don't you have an eye for workouts and uh, giving some, some advice. So what do you think? Like, yeah, part? just do burpees fast and you'll be fine. Uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm not down with that, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, 
<laughs> lately, um, my burpees have gotten a lot better because my hips have become more mobile. But before, I had to do like step up burpees, and that just like torched my legs. Um, but also controlling your breathing. For the longest time, I would do burpees where when your chest hits the ground, you completely expel all your air, and then you're trying to breathe in as you're going up. But if you do try and don't match your breathing with your reps, try and go longer, more controlled breathing as you go through versus you know, doing, cause if you breathe, if breathing heavier while you're doing your burpees, you're going to get winded a lot faster. So that's one thing that I can learn that helped me out as well. And you, I mean, you don't need to do burpees super fast, but make them efficient, uh, step out wide. And, you know, every once in a while it is go okay to stop and breathe and look at the ground. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I agree. So a um, few more tips on the burpees. If you do take a slightly wider stance than normal, um, you can't go too wide that that'll have its own, that'll bring up its own issues. So you don't want to be super narrow, especially if you're taller, because that's a lot of ground to cover to get down. Right. So widen your stance just a little bit. If you do it too much, you're probably going to like your hip flexors are going to freak out on you. Um, so widen that stance a little bit uh, to shorten the distance to the ground. And then also the jump on a burpee to me, this is, so let's just say garage gym athlete standard yeah. is just, you have to clear the ground. I don't care. It, it, there's no like, Oh, okay. Six inch jump or three inch jump, or you just clear the ground. Just, you need to get off the ground with both feet and that's it for the jump. That's, that's my, my standard. So for me, that might be if we could actually measure it, I don't know, six millimeters. Like I, I just do enough to get off the ground and then I'm, I'm on my way back down as soon yeah, as my you're feet not hit going the ground. Like a burpee touch, so that's my tips on burpees. And I would agree with and, your wide uh, stance too. Like if you keep it and by wide, I'm yeah. saying, I'm thinking like a little bit past shoulder width apart. Would you agree on that? Yeah. So like you have your stance there, go down yeah. and then your feet come back to where you are. Cause I have found that if you have go with, you bring your feet in and it's narrow and then you do your jump and then jump back out, that actually takes more time in my personal opinion, or it does with me at least. Yeah. And it, there's also the recovery of a burpee. So getting, you know, once you're fully laying down, coming back up, um, you can just bring both legs up at the same time, or you can, kind of like one step and then another. Yeah, because I I haven't gotten to the number of burpees where that strategy is necessary, but I realized that if you were doing a lot of them, you probably would in all honesty blow out your hip flexors. Yeah. Like they just would they would give up on you. And um doing that little step would help significantly, but if 109 or less, let's say, your your hip flexors are probably going to be fine. Um, that might not be true for everybody. My hip flexors will be fine at 109 or less. Um, so just keep that in mind too, as a possible recovery from the burpee. <laughs> and we, I, we analyze the crap out of this work. I didn't think we'd have that much to say about it, but there's there a lot to say about burpees. I, I could dive into burpee. even just more tips on how up. to row Ugh. 2000 meters for a time trial, but Is I that, don't know if I need to. Yeah. People can, can get yeah, smoked on the down. upper body. And if you did the, uh, the, yep. was it one fifty That's all five thousand or whatever, then you'll know after this push presses that you need uh, the proper way to do a burpee because you're not going to be able to do regular push ups because <laughs> you're done. So try and carry that over. Two week, I think week one was the one five one fifty five thousand. Two weeks ago, I think. Yeah, we did a lot of burpees. Yep. Was that last yep. week? Yeah. Yep. And then we had to one to ten to one last week. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, some people have mentioned I may be doing that because the Spartan race is coming up. Hey, that that's, that's not necessarily the case. Just burpees are good for you. Uh, now the time trial, uh, I'm not going to give any more tips on that. I just think just make it a time trial. You know, you could, you could focus on your form or whatever, just make it a significant, uh, time trial to push yourself in that you get, you have plenty of rest. You know, it's seven minutes of rest before you, before you attempt that next one. So you'll, you'll be recovered. Um, so make it hard. If you don't, then it, uh, the, the workout's not that, that crazy. If you don't, <laughs> not that challenging. All right. That's, uh, that's all I have. You guys have anything else on that workout? <laughs> what How should people tie their shoes? No. Okay. Oh boy. So, um, let's, so why, <laughs> why be a garage uh, athlete, Joe? 
<laughs> because we can actually make you better at burpees. It's been a while since Less we've done the, uh, the outro of selling Garage Gym Athlete hard. There you go. Yeah. Because we right, are Ashley, here. Do you have any reasons why someone should sign up for Garage Gym goals, Athlete? Maybe we are here for you. There you go. We're awesome at selling. And if you can't tell, there is, if you go to garagemally.com, you can snag a 14-day free trial. Sign up if uh, you like our training. Fantastic. Welcome to the fold. If you don't, that's all right. Move on. It's a free trial. It costs you nothing to sign up. Um, so there you go. Sign up. Uh, get involved with what our, is it eight tracks now if we're counting this, uh, the, the beta of the women's health track? A lot of stuff. We have a lot of different areas that we can help peop, uh, people improve. Um, Peace. And, and that's all I got. So until next time. Thanks for listening to the Garage Gym Athlete podcast. If you want to learn more, go to garagegymathlete.com. You can learn about our training. Let us send you a copy of our book, The Garage Gym Athlete, or you can even get featured on the Garage Gym Athlete podcast. Thanks for listening.